Our next guest is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, a shark on the hit ABC series Shark Tank, and an entrepreneur's entrepreneur doing little things like revolutionizing the drug industry. Please welcome Mark Cuban to the South by Southwest studio. Hello, sir. Hey, uh, I'm very disappointed because I have stereotypes of wealthy, uh, influential folks, and you did not walk in here with an entourage. You just came here by yourself. Yeah. How dare you, sir? You know, how I know how to you? walk. I know how to get on an elevator. I <laughs> all by yourself. All by myself. Listen, I, I'm an NBA fan, uh, so I have to give you condolences. Yesterday's yeah. game, it was tough. It was close. It was close. It was close. Yeah, we should have pulled it out, but we didn't. Uh, Dylan Brooks of the Grizzlies talked immense smack against Kyrie Irving. Is there anything you want to say to Dylan right now? Who? Oh! <laughs> respect. There you go. That was cold-blooded. Uh, first off, a lot to talk about, but the news of the day. I got friends in the Bay Area. I'm originally from the Bay, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, last couple of days, we found out there was a bank run. Uh, all this money is not there. So many companies, so many entrepreneurs, so many startups, so many people want to be the next Mark Cuban. Do not know if they're going to make payroll next week. Yeah. You have said Fed needs to intervene. Tell us what the Fed needs to do. Tell us why people should take this very seriously. So first of all, let me just say, I'm not a banking expert, right? So this is just the perspective of an entrepreneur, an investor, and somebody who's got businesses who do, that have accounts at um, Silicon Valley Bank. But, you know, if you look, and I've learned more about banking in the last 48 hours than I think I ever <laughs> have. But when you look at it, um, it's not that the bank didn't have good assets, right? They were just mismatched terms, meaning that, the investments that they made in securities and the loans that they made were longer term. And that's 99.9999% of the time that's fine unless there's a bank run. Which is and, what happened. Which is what happened. And the probability of a bank run in the United States of America is 0. .000001, but it happened. So as a result, they have assets that, you know, if not cover, come close to covering the value of their deposits, but they just don't have access. They can't... Um, turn them into capital, turn it into cash to support the deposits. It's stuck in the ether. It's stuck, yeah. It's stuck in loans, basically, yeah. right? And so um, because they don't have access to that capital, there was a bank run and they, had, they were shut down. Yeah. And so because this is not a situation where they just went out and lost billions of dollars of depositors' money. They didn't lose it, right? Um, but it's not there. Well, like People need it right now. It, it's not liquid, yeah. right? It, it's almost like if you get called on your house, and your house is worth a million dollars, but you can't sell it to get you know, the money out that you need, then you're illiquid and, and bad things happen. So in this particular case, it's a matter of liquidity, which is what the Fed does. The Fed provides liquidity. So they can come in and say, we will make sure the depositors are made whole. Yeah. That's uh, usually what happens in banks, right? Typically, right. De deposit with us. If something happens, if there's a robbery, we got you. Right. And so you know, the challenge is if they don't do something close to that, then there's going to be a lot of people questioning the trust, questioning their trust in the banking system. And a lot of people, companies I've invested in included, who are saying they will withdraw from all but the biggest banks because they don't want to face that risk. Which is happening right now. Well, it's right. not happening. It's Sunday, I mean, but, right? I mean, no, yeah. but I'm right now with the SVB, and I'm talking about that risk that is affecting so many of our friends, right? Mm -hmm. I, and just to connect the dots, right, because I was talking to a friend of mine, entrepreneur, successful, uh, invest in startups, and he's like, man, I'm dealing with so many panicked phone calls. Oh, yeah. Next week, people have no idea. The Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. So he's explained. Connect the dots for us, for folks who so don't if, see the, the, the dominoes falling right now. So if you are a typical company, let's just say you have 10 employees and $5 million in sales, you have to have a bank account that pays your payroll. Mm. Right or writes the checks to a service that does your payroll. You probably have a bank account that may be the same one that does your accounts payable. They probably have a bank account, again, maybe the same one that does your inventory management, right? And so those accounts aren't going to be under $250,000, even if you're a small business. So now you don't have access to that anymore. Mm -hmm. So employees may not get paid. The payroll may not be made. Vendors may not get paid because the accounts payable don't get paid. And those companies now have a problem because the, they didn't get their bills paid for what they sold you. And now their, prob now their employees are at risk and all the way down and cascades down. So, you know, I don't know what the, the max risk is for taxpayers, the Federal Reserve, but 
I mean, the estimates I've seen is worst case, it's $6 billion, mm. which is a lot of money, but relative to the, the carnage that could happen if the Fed doesn't step up, it's, it's de minimis. You're talking about Fed stepping up, and you know a lot of people were dunking on libertarians who were saying, Feds should never step in, there should be no intrusion, and now they're like, wait, wait, please, for the love of God, intervene. Yeah, right. right. So is this not a warning sign that maybe, maybe we should have more regulation, more oversight, so this does not happen again and again. You know, and again. there's two sides to that coin, right? On one hand, I don't have a problem with rolling back the changes they made in 2018 in terms of who qualifies for higher, um, for more detailed regulation. Mm. Um, I wouldn't even have a problem of, of making it a little bit more draconian, right? Because you, you never should be in a position where um, depositors' money is put at risk. Mm. Um, so I'm not opposed to that. But on the, the flip side, um, in terms of the libertarian side, you just there's just no good solution that's laissez-faire because if you want to see an entire economy decimated go laissez-faire and you'll see what comes up from the ashes maybe it's better but i doubt it all right so you're in the middle here you're you're a moderate in this yeah i mean i look i try to be pragmatic okay I'm, i don't try to be you know liberal or conservative i don't care i just look at the math i look at the consequences i look at it try to look at it holistically and when there's the chance you know, on one hand, the government is at risk, if this number is right, $6 billion versus, you know, the unknown, which could be a cascading impact of hundreds of billions of dollars and hundreds, you know, of thousands of lost jobs, if not millions of lost Communities jobs. that are impacted. Yeah, communities, States. companies going out of business. And again, you know, it wasn't like you're going to be, it's not like you're going to be rewarding the, the management of Silicon Valley Bank. It's not like, okay, we're going to protect your stock options. Mm. It's not like we're going to protect the equity in the company. The, the guy who runs Silicon Valley Bank, whatever his name is, all that stock he owned at his company, gone. Yep. It's dust. Whatever you know, net worth he had associated with this company he's worked at for decades, apparently, gone. Mm. It's, it, it's, it's not worth anything. And so it's not like this is a bailout where, like the Great Recession, where you had companies that really made bad decisions as an industry. The crappy loans. Yeah, as an industry, right? And now, you know, in a bailout sense, they were rewarding the, the bad people actors. Who, yeah, the people who worked at the bank, right? Yeah. That's not the case here at all. Yeah, and a lot of innocent people are going to suffer. Unfortunately. A lot of innocent people. Hopefully, hopefully there is a nice solution there. Uh, talking about disruption, it's, it's a word that was very fancy in the last 20 years, and a lot of yeah. people are like, we don't need more disruption. We just want peace and calm for the love of God. <laughs> but what some people want to disrupt is the pharmaceutical company. Yeah. And you have said, I'm going to quote you, my goal is to, quote, F up the pharmacy industry. I didn't use the word. I didn't use the letter F. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> what did you say, sir? I just said fuck up the industry, right? Okay, it, good. It needs to be fucked that's up. A, that's above I'm my favorite. I'm fuck it up every day, you know? <laughs> yeah. Hey, and, and you're fucking up with Mark Cuban's. You, first time you put your name on something. Mark Cuban's yeah. Cost Plus Drugs Company. First time ever. All right. Tell me why. Why put your name on this company? Because it's 2023 in the United States of America, and there's still people who have to choose between medications, rent, and food, mm. and that's insane. And so when you start looking at the industry and start asking why, uh, it goes back to the, it's such an opaque industry where there's zero transparency. And it's funny, because we started this um, four years ago, but only actually launched it 13 months ago. And a lot of it was because the, um, the Pharma Bro Shkreli, right? I was talking to my partner. Pharma Alex, Bro Shkreli. Yeah, right? Deep cut. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so I was talking to my partner, Dr. Oshmyansky, and I was like, look, if this pharma dude can increase prices 7,500%, mm. that means there's got to be such a market distortion going on, no. we should be able to cut prices th in the same manner. And so starting with generics, we've gone out and put together an inventory list so far of 1,100 SKUs, but the key to it is transparency. So when you go to costplusdrugs.com and you put in the name of your medication, whatever it may be. Example? Um, so imatinib, right, which right. is a drug for chemotherapy. Um, and so you put in imatinib, and the first thing that comes up is our cost. We show you exactly what we pay for it. Then we show you our markup, which is 15%. Then we show you what we charge for the pharmacy, what to pay the pharmacist, right? The fill fee, and then the shipping, because we're initially we're mail order. That's it. You see exactly what we pay our markups. So you know exactly what it is, and because of that simplicity of transparency, our pricing is in some cases 
insanely less. So with a matnib, before we got in this business, if you were to prescribe a matnib, and like you know how it typically goes when you get a prescription from your doctor. Doctor says you need this medication, right? To survive because you're getting chemotherapy. Right, and just it could be anything, right? And then the next question is, what pharmacy do you use? Yep. It's not. This is what it's going to cost. It's not. And the crazy part is, even the pharmacist doesn't know what they're going to charge you until you show up and you show the prescription. Oh, hey. And then you're like, oh, this, I thought this was covered. Right. And, and so for the, in the case of a matinib, people were getting charged more than $2,000. For a life-saving medication. For a life-saving medication. We've, since, we've had a bunch of um, price cuts. I think our price now, depending on the strength, is $12. Wow. Wow. Which is, which is I mean, I, I rarely want to use this word, uh, but that's sinful. It is sinful. You know, it's insane, and it's only because the entire healthcare industry, but um, particularly pharmaceuticals, is opaque. Nobody knows the actual cost of anything. I'll give you another example. A friend of mine emailed me, and we have a mutual friend who had, was in a horrific car wreck, and he has to take a drug called droxidopa. And I didn't even know what that was, right? And so he, he said, well, our friend Landon told us that he was going to have to spend, he lost his insurance, and he was going to have to spend $30,000 every three months. I'm like, I don't know what this drug is, but let me check. Mm. I go, we find a manufacturer for it. $61 a month is what we charge them. Gosh. I mean, just the fact that that is a possibility. And so, you and know. The fact that it's, it's happening in the most powerful country on earth. It's insane. And people are, I'll give an example. Uh, diabetes runs in my family and father has it. There are Americans right now who are rationing their insulin. Yep. Young people who have to ration their insulin because they can't afford it. Now, history lesson for the folks who are out there. The original inventors of insulin deliberately sold the patent for $1. In 1903. The, inten the yep. intention was we want this life-saving medicine to go to everyone. There's about three companies that dominate the market. Mm -hmm. In the United States, the cost of insulin, this life-saving medication, is higher than any other country in the world. And yep. just about, I think, two weeks ago, one of the manufacturers, Eli Lilly, said, you know what? Maybe we should cap it at 35 bucks. Yep. And in... And it, the, the, it's like you sit there and go, well, thank you, Eli and Lily. But Finally, this, right? But at the same time, it's like, what, why did it take public shaming for them? Well, see, here's and the crazy part. And a fake tweet. Well, yeah, really, right? So here's the crazy part. Even though the retail price of insulin from Eli Lilly may have been $400 a vial, whatever it been, the net revenue that Eli Lilly actually received for that vial was in the $20 range right, or $22, because there's this thing called pharmacy benefit managers, and there's three big ones, the big three, and what they do is they are responsible for negotiating the price of medications for all the big insurance companies that they own, and so they go to Eli Lilly, and they say, you know, and all the in insulin manufacturers, set the price of the retail price really, really high, because then we can go to the insurance companies and say, we're giving them a 90% or 80% mm. discount, right? Mm. And then we, all, then we go back to the manufacturers and we say, well, you know, also give us a rebate so that at the end of the day, the price to Eli, the price, the revenue to Eli Lilly is minimal, right? Not all that much at all, but they're made out to be the bad guys. In reality, it's the PBMs that are creating all the problems. And so with costplusdrugs.com, we've completely cut out the PBMs. We deal directly with the manufacturers, we deal directly with distributors, and there are no rebates in anything we do, no spread pricing, all these little games that the PBMs play, which allows us to price our drugs so much less and also opened up the door from Eli Lilly to not work in the traditional system so they can charge less. Farm to supplier to table. Yeah, basically farm yeah. to supplier to table. Minimize the costs. Yes. Yes, yeah, uh, reduce the friction. And, and hopefully this Fs it up in a big way because it, it, I, I rarely use the word, but it is a sin, the fact that people have to pay $2,000 for a life-saving medication that costs 12 bucks. Yeah, I mean, and you see it across healthcare yeah. and not just pharmaceuticals. You know, I tried to do a study one time going to hospitals and just asking the CFOs um, what cost accounting they use. Nobody would participate. No one wants to tell them themselves. You know, now there was a, a law passed that said um, hospitals have to show all their pricing on their websites. And the fine's only $100 a day not to do it. There are hospitals that choose not to do it. We'll take the fine. Yeah, exactly. And I would recommend, like, I had to get a CT scan for something. And, Is um, everything fine? You're doing good? good? Yeah, right, good. Right. I had to ask. Yeah, I appreciate it. And so, um, and my son actually, uh, or my daughter actually hurt her wrist playing basketball and needed um, an MRI. And I told my wife. Call and ask for the cash price. Don't go to our insurance company first because we self-insure, so it's just coming right out of my pocket. And so the, um, the MRI from 
the for the cash price from the same place was four hundred dollars. The cash price or the insurance price that they were going to charge my insurance company, which in turn was going to charge me plus a markup, twenty two hundred dollars. Jeez. And and this is not going to make you feel better, but I married up. I married a doctor, so I asked my wife, "Listen, I'm just an unfrozen caveman lawyer. I wear white powder on my face once in a while. I you know just get on front of television. What do I know?" She goes, "Listen, I'm a doctor. The healthcare industry is effed up." This is it's wrong, it's and even I don't get it. So when my wife doesn't get it, yeah. the average Jose and Jane who just needs to survive, we're just at the beck and call of it's these people awful. making money off us and our pain. It's awful. Costplusdrugs.com. I mean, anybody out there that uses particularly generic medications, we're just now starting to add brand names. Um, go to our site and check it out, so you'll know exactly why it costs. Give you another example. Um, because our prices are public and we're transparent, there are organizations now that are using our price list and comparing them to what Medicare pays. And so there was a urologist who took just three of our urology drugs, just three, and said that Medicare would save as much as $1.2 billion a year on these three medications if they, they bought through CostPlusDrugs.com. That's all I'm saying. I mean, it's a, it's a good ad for cost plus drugs, no, but it could save lives. Be, yeah, of yeah. course. I'm going to be pitching us all day yeah. long because it's a good cause. But uh, okay, we had uh, to flip the script a little bit. Sure. Because uh, you're among the privileged, as you know, and we've survived a pandemic. And during the pandemic, as more than a million Americans died, income inequality, you know what happened. The rich got richer, poor got poor. We had a guest yesterday, Douglas Rushkoff, who you might know is a top 10 intellectual, but he's talking about the billionaire mindset. And according to his research, he says the billionaire mindset has to change. And he says the billionaire mindset is such that billionaires, instead of investing back in communities, many billionaires are trying to escape, literally, rockets, islands, underground bunkers. And doing the research, he says what happens with billionaires, once you get that type of power, Things shut down, like connectivity. They just don't see the rest of the people. They, they think they're better or above. And he is a crit critic of billionaires. Uh, he's a critic of the billionaire mindset. But your response to the billionaire mindset, because I heard you're a billionaire. Yeah. How is your mindset? How do you stay connected, if at all, to the plebeians, to the rest so of us? So if I was broke like I've been, right, sleeping on the floor, negative bank balance, and you generalized about everybody in my circumstances, what would people say? They'd say there's a lot more of you than there are billionaires. Well, they would say you can't generalize about somebody just because they're poor. Mm. That there's, there's skill, there's talent, they're unique individuals. And it's the same with rich people too, right? I'm the luckiest motherfucker on the planet, right? I admit that. You can't be a billionaire without a lot of luck, a yeah. lot of great timing, right? That's just the way it works. But the whole idea that we disconnect, that, you know, that's ridiculous. The billionaire mindset, God help me if I think like anybody else because of their bank account. You know, that's, that's, that's wrong in the first place. You know, you know, I just, that's just not the way I feel. To disconnect, to go into space, you know, I just don't, I get the sense that it, it sells books and it gets you interviewed, but I don't know who he's talked to. He certainly, he certainly talk talked to me. You want to talk yeah, to him? Yeah, I don't care. He can get, give him my email. Because, That's fine. because what he's saying, and for many folks, as, as you saw, there was, a, there was a, a report on Fox that when they said, oh, my God, liberals want to have rich people pay taxes. And then they did the poll, and Fox viewers were like, hey, this sounds like a good idea. Yeah, of course. And many people are like, hey, if the nurse and the worker and the camera operator are paying their taxes, not you, but why do a lot of folks who are the 1% use the loopholes, and how come they're not paying their taxes? If they want to help people, just pay your taxes. So first of all, I wrote a blog post 20 years ago saying after military service, the most patriotic thing you could do is pay your taxes. I don't have a problem paying more taxes. Um, this year, my tax, my rate was lower because it was mostly um, capital gains. I think I paid 19% this year. I paid 29% last year and 20-something percent the year before. Right? So you're, you're okay telling your colleagues, hey, man, just pay some more taxes. Fuck yeah. Pay some more taxes. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit you can do. Yeah, I mean, whether, you know, now where it goes wrong and where I think people like Elizabeth Warren get it wrong, dead wrong, is if you start taxing appreciable assets that haven't been sold. Oh, you're against, the, you're against that? Because think about, I talked to one of our economists or somebody who said that he was an economist for her, and I said, did you do a one-year model, which looks really good because you don't have to deal with the consequences of changes in behavior, or did you do a 10-year model? He did a one-year model. And then what that means is when you tax assets that have appreciated but haven't been sold, I don't know how much they're going to appreciate. Mm. So I've got to save a lot of cash to pay the potential um, tax that I have to pay, which means I'm not investing in cost-plus drugs. 
So if I didn't, it's going to cost me a lot of money to build costplusdrugs.com. We're building a $40 million factory in Dallas to do injectables for drugs that are in short supply. You, you know, doctors and hospitals can't get Pitocin and sterile water, you know, lidocaine, all these things. If I have to save, you know, my potential tax rate because I don't know how much those assets are going to appreciate, I can't take the same risk. I, I, I would love to, to invite you back so we can follow up on that one. But thank you that you're using your money to invest in Cost Plus. I have to ask you this question. I only got a minute left. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, Elon Musk, can you convince him to get off Twitter? I don't care. It's his company. He can do whatever he pleases. Uh, you really. feel like he's using his I don't his know what his billionaire you, mindset is. Do you is. feel like he's using his billionaire mindset for the good? I don't know. I don't. I don't have. I have no reason to judge or care what he does or says. You know, if if you like Twitter, use it. If you don't like Twitter, get off of it. it Twitter is not like a core asset that we all need. It's not food, shelter. It's Twitter. How about TikTok? Gen Z's watching. Yeah, I mean, yank it. I don't care, right? And and the, but I'll give parents a hack. I've got three kids: 13, 16, and 19, right? And one of the parental hacks. Do you have any kids? I got three. How old? Eight, six, three. Okay, so maybe the eight, no, they're not old enough to be on there yet. So I just go on their Twitter and I can see exactly what, or on their TikTok, I get to see exactly what they're into, right? Because the algorithm gives them what they like and it gives more and more and more. So I just, you know, give me your phone. Let me see what you're doing. And I'm going to regulate your TikTok I, I know. Like if you're into something I don't like, then we're going to deal with uh, it. Final question as we leave. Uh, in Ratatouille, the chef says, anyone can cook. Do you believe, Mark Cuban, that anyone can be an investor and an entrepreneur? Um... Yes, of course. I mean, I think we're all inherently entrepreneurs. It's just you have to find the thing that you're good at so you can be a successful entrepreneur. And what would you say, in addition to luck, is the best, most valuable trait that can really help someone survive? Effort. Yeah, for entrepreneurs, it's effort because it's nonstop. You don't know what to expect. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be. You know, your business may be crushing it, and then somebody makes a mistake on the term of their notes at Silicon Valley Bank, and the next minute you go from, I'm on top of the world, to how am I going to make payroll? That's the nature of being an entrepreneur. Thank you, sir. Sure, right. may, Thanks, may my Warriors see your Mavs in the playoffs, yeah, and, I'm may, good with that. and may my Warriors prevail. You can see our complete wow. schedule of upcoming studio interviews on our website at sxsw.com studio. These interviews are live streaming during the event on our YouTube channel at youtube.com sxsw. And I'm your host, Wajah Thanks for watching.